Testing, testing. Hello, folks. So, eight weeks in, one final announcement. So, let me talk briefly about Chapter 16, which is about environmental ethics. And turn to my PowerPoint because I actually have a fair number of images for you all here. Here we go. So uh, authors raise the question on page 351, to what extent do animals and plants have rights? And I think that is indeed an important question. Let me just observe, however, that the novel Blood Beauty by Anna Sewell and Ernest Seaton's Wild Animals I Have Known are often credited for sparking the concern about animal welfare, since they both use the literary conceit of putting the, uh, the reader within the mind of an animal. I might also add, but it's part of the reason why I usually favor text myself over video. When we read another's words, uh, we temporarily participate in their cognition. Reading allows us to participate in another person's worldview, whereas with audio-visual material like this, uh, we are necessarily outsiders looking in. Now, on page 351 or through 352, our authors give us a number of key terms, but I want to add another one that is currently having its moment. That's called panpsychism. This is the notion that consciousness is embedded in the very nature of existence. Um, it's one attempt to engage with the besetting problems of noetics, the science of consciousness. How to account for the something extra problem if we assume that consciousness is somehow external to existence? How do we account for the fact that some creatures are very evidently sentient. Panpsychism would hold that every cell, every molecule, every atom has some level of consciousness. The reason why consciousness, indeed self-awareness, is only evident in certain species then can be put down to the complex structure of their bodies and brains. Put another way, you and I are obviously more self-aware than uh, a dog or a cat. But is that because of something external that we've been given, say, for example, a soul? Or is that a matter of the structure of the human brain, which is so complex that it creates a gestalt, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts that accounts for our self-awareness? There's an obvious resonance between this notion of panpsychism and the idea of Atman and Brahman. And both these concepts are found in both Hinduism and Buddhism and are discussed later in our text. On page 352, the authors make reference to the fact that primitive and indigenous populations tend to see themselves as being part of nature. Now, one of the best accounts I've encountered of this view is under Audrey Shindoa in a documentary called Spirit and Nature, which I have linked off of the print version of this announcement, uh, expressing a Native American perspective of how humans are or should relate to nature. Uh, long in short, she was a Native American elder and she very, um, eloquently talked about how from her tribe's perspective, nature was personal. They spoke of the sky, the moon, the mountain, the land, in personal terms as if they were relatives. It's not very different from the way that we in the West tend to see the natural world. On page 353, our authors state rather boldly that human beings are basically carnivores. I 
I'm sorry, folks, I have to question and challenge that. Uh, for one thing, I live in my household with three different carnivores, uh, members of the species Catus, Felis Catus. The domestic house cat is an obligate carnivore. Its digestive system is specifically adapted to an all meat diet. By contrast, we human beings are technically omnivores, like our friend raccoon in this illustration. We can eat and digest both meat and plant material. And last time I checked, more and more of us Homo sapiens are adopting the veg vegetarian or vegan diets out of concerns about the environment and out of concerns for our health. Uh, my wife, for example, is a strict pescatorian, and which is to say that she eats fish and veggies and fruit, but she does not eat any red meat. And as a result, I mostly, yeah, I must admit, I do enjoy some bacon and or sausage with my only morning eggs, but every couple of days or so. But I'm mostly pescatarian as a result. Page 354, our author states that some people argue that given what we know about the way animals are raised, we should stop eating meat at all. Now, I think that's a little bit extreme. There is a middle ground, which I don't think our authors have recognized. Some people prefer to pay a little more for their animal products if they are given a guarantee that they are humanely raised and slaughtered. Um, that is another reason why I usually start my day with free range eggs. Oh, well, that image doesn't, doesn't show up for some reason. Gosh, long and short, uh, free range eggs are far tastier than factory farm eggs. Uh, the notion likely underlies the recent legislation, which I've provided a link to, passed here in California to ensure that pigs and chickens sold for food are raised in humane conditions. Page 355 through 356, I think our authors have missed a key link in the intellectual history behind the distinctly Western notion that human, humankind is separate above or apart from nature. Although Plato uh, is usually credited with, credited with form, formulating the notion that humans have access to the real reality that is beyond the reality that we usually experience, which is to say the kingdom of the forms, not the world of ideas as our authors are expressive. They miss a key part of how this became a conventional understanding in the West. That can, I think, be put down to the enduring influence of one man, St. Augustine. Um, before Augustine of Hippo converted to Christianity, he was engaged with Neoplatonism, a semi-religious understanding of Plato's philosophy, and Manichaeism an extremely dualistic religion, which was spun off of Zoroastrianism. In, incidentally, as a scholar of world religions, I find Manichaeism quite interesting because it's the one instance I know of, of a religion that grew to be a world religion and then died. Usually when a religion um, grows beyond national or even social borders, it persists, but Manichaeism spread throughout the known world of its time, and then it died off. And as a scholar, I find that very interesting. Um, now, more than one scholar I've read have traced the influence of these two traditions, Neoplatonism and Manichaeism, on the Christian theology propounded by St. Augustine. Indeed, Augustine is sometimes described as having, quote unquote, baptized Plato by incorporating Platonist ideas into Christian theology. On page 356, our authors mention the religious notion that human beings are meant to have dominion over nature. Now, the irony here 
means that that is largely a Christian understanding. I'm, since I teach world religions, I have a chance to engage with more than one learned rabbi. And I will ask them specifically about this expression. And they tell me that in the original Hebrew, God giving mankind dominion over the world is more properly understood as mankind had the responsibility for the natural world. From a Jewish perspective, apparently human beings are not meant to rule the natural world. We are meant to be caretakers of it. Very, very different. On page 357, our authors state that morality does not exist as far as the rest of nature is concerned. But I'm sorry, folks, as I've had to point out before, uh, that's been refuted. Many biologists have discerned empath empathetic behavior among non-human social species. Rats aren't really considered a social species. They are more scavengers, but even rats will want, given a choice between a tasty treat and saving a fellow rat that's on the brink of drowning, they will save the fellow rat first. Gosh, if only human beings were to that extent, bit closer to our good and privacy. I have uh, before expressed my misgivings about how our authors sometimes refer to Christian scripture as authority. Um, but both because that belies a rather occidental world view. You know, folks, humankind has been wrestling with issues of ethics for as long as recorded history goes back, which is roughly about 6,000 years. But it's not just people in the West that have been struggling with these issues. Our good friends in the East have also done so. Um, but also, part of the problem with referring to scriptures of issue uh, in terms of ethics is that scripture is mostly more about morals than ethics. It's about a received authority, typically received authority because of divine revelation. To the good, however, I have to give our authors credit uh, um, in this chapter, and I don't hope I don't sound like I've been just dissing them all this time, because to the good, um, they in this chapter they have finally worked. What is it? Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism into the same chapter. Now. I also have to add, I think those references told the requirements of ethics a bit better because these religious traditions are often deemed to be philosophical religions. Their scriptures rely for their authority on their common sense observations, insight, and wisdom, as opposed to divine authorship. For example, Mahavira, one of the major figures in Jainism, Buddha, founder of Buddhism, Lao Tzu, founder of Taoism, and Confucius, never claimed divine parentage or revelation. They were just articulating their own thoughts about the nature of human existence, what constituted a good life while lived, how human beings are supposed to interact with each other, with society, with the state, and with the environment. Uh, now, I must admit that um, their followers often attributed divine parentage to them subsequently. But the Buddha never said, take my word for it because I am God. Confucius never claimed to be a divine incarnation. These systems started off as philosophy and eventually became religion. 
So there's my thoughts about my comments and observations about what our authors have to say about uh, environmental ethics to the bad. I, again, they seem to go a whole chapter with sometimes going sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, sometimes page after page without citing a source to support some rather broad statements of fact. But on the other hand, kudos. They are finally acknowledging that there is a world east of ancient Greece. And that as it's called of religion, I have to appreciate that. So kudos, dudes. Way to roll. Well, OK, this is my final announcement, near as I can tell for this class. If you have any thoughts, questions, if there's anything that you need clarified or elaborated, please know I'm always as close as an email. Or if you prefer, uh, I am also available by Zoom. But if you want to talk with me via Zoom, I hope you type really fast because, as I mentioned, I'm hearing disabled. And on Zoom, I have to depend upon what shows up in the chat field. So we are almost at the end of this class. Here's the good news. I never flunk any of my students. I always tell my students exactly what I'm looking for. I tell them that both in announcements and also in direct um, feedback on the assignments and also sometimes via email, also sometimes via Zoom calls. So we're almost to the end here. If you are dissatisfied with your current uh, grade level, well, you can still make up. Contact me by email, or if you want to talk by Zoom, I guess I can do that as well, but email would be more efficient. And you can probably significantly improve your grade by addressing the points that I've brought up that you may have omitted originally. Although to the good, I'm seeing a lot better work lately in terms of people referring to the actual reading assignments to support their points. So kudos to you for that. Oh, and this is the sign that my wife just gave me. I'm pretty sure she's joking. You are Jogi, aren't you? Yes, yes, she's indicating that she is. Because folks, that would not be ethical. Okay, this is probably the final assignment for or announcement for this class, but feel free to email me or Zoom me uh, if you want further elaboration or clarification about any of my feedback on any of the assignments.